Good afternoon and welcome. It's good to see you. It's my great pleasure to introduce our lecturer, Professor Dr. Friedrich Nissel, Professor of Systematic Theology at Heidelberg University. As, been, as has been noted in introductions to her previous lectures here, she is widely published. She's recipient of many awards and fellowships and sits on numerous editorial boards. Professor Nissel is a Lutheran, uh, as am I, and I'm honored to share that affiliation with her. I don't think we've said that uh, in the introductions before this. As a Lutheran theologian, she has been particularly active in, as a member of numerous ecumenical dialogue groups and ecumenical commissions involving the World Council of Churches, Roman Catholics, Church of England, Mennonites, and other Protestant denominations. We Lutherans like to talk to other Christians. <laughs> Appropriately, she is also director of Heidelberg's uh, Ecumenical Institute, as well as serving as the dean of the Ecumenical International Student Hall, which is a residence for 25 students from different backgrounds, denominations, and fields of study who live together, do ecumenical theological research, and practice an intentionally rich global ecumenical community life together. I first came to know Professor Nissel when she joined a group of which I was a part, the Society of Biblical Theologians. The group is an interdisciplinary and ecumenical group of systematic theologians, of biblical scholars, both Old and New Testaments, church historians, and Christian ethicists all of whom are interested in theological interpretation of scripture, but from many and different vantage points. Federica has been a, a joyful, kind, open, curious, intellectually rigorous, and substantive contributor to our interdisciplinary group, which meets only once a year, but that one meeting is a precious one. It is a meeting around meals, wine, and deep and constructive engagements with papers and research that we take turns presenting each year. I always come away from those weekends refreshed, energized, and appreciative of members like Frederica who embody in her person the theology that she writes on the page. In her lecture last evening on the creating spirit as the power of diversity, she highlighted the spirit's active dynamism, its creation and celebration of diversity and difference, and the spirit's capacity to knit together life-giving webs of relationship and interaction in which God makes room for the freedom and flourishing of the other. As I reflected on the lecture afterward, it struck me that in light of that rich understanding of the work of the spirit, Professor Nussel herself is very spirit-filled, not just in her thought, but in her person, whether in her work, her friendships, her hospitality at the Ecumenical Institute, and her tireless efforts to create bridges and relationships across difference, theological or otherwise. It is a joy to know someone who so well embodies with integrity what she believes and thinks. The title of the fourth Annie Kincaid Warfield Lecture for 2022 is The Redeeming Spirit as the Gift of Recognition. Please join me in welcoming once again, Professor Friedrika Nissel. You have made me all, almost speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Is that me that you described? <laughs> well, fortunately, we speak about sin and grace. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I start with the first point, negating the spirit in the doctrine of salvation, question mark. In the last two lectures, I developed the dogmatic topoi of the doctrine of God and the doctrine of creation from the perspective of the work of the spirit. In today's, I turn to the questions about the role ascribed to the spirit in the salvation event. 
It might seem that there is no need to rework the role of the spirit in the doctrine of salvation, since unlike in the doctrine of creation, where the work of the spirit is only addressed en passant, the work of the spirit has an important role to play in the New Testament's understanding of salvation. Accordingly, the part of dogmatics dealing explicitly with redemption or salvation traditionally includes Christology and pneumatology. What is new to be said here for dogmatics developed from a pneumatology perspective? To dig a bit deeper into this question, I would like to take a closer look at the development of soteriology in the Protestant tradition, as I'm always doing history. <laughs> To be sure, there are many significant differences between Reformed and Lutheran dogmatics, which arose during the so-called confessional times, particularly in the time period between the Reformation and the Enlightenment. One unifying feature is the notion of the salvific event as being the work of Jesus Christ and mediated through the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Holy Spirit assures that humans participate in the act of salvation. The work of the Spirit was thereby conceived along biblical lines as describing the effects of the Spirit's works in humans, conversion, rebirth, inspiration, justification, sanctification, etc. That's the ordo salutis. In so doing, the effects of the spirit in the individual person would be described first and thereafter the effects in the gathering of the church would be addressed. Once again, it was Schleiermacher who made a significant alteration in the conception of his Glaubenslehre and from my perspective, further advances the Christocentric movement of thought in Western theology. To do so, he no longer spoke about a work of the spirit in the individual human. It is only from within the emergence of the church that Schleiermacher speaks of the work of the spirit. <clears throat> the spirit for Schleiermacher is a communal spirit, Gemeingeist. The spirit gathers the humans into co the community of the church. Therein lies the spirit's essence. The largest gain in this development in Schleiermacher's thought lies in his emphasis on the significance of the community for being a Christian. For Schleiermacher, sin not only corrupted humans, but all social relations. <clears throat> sin has to be overcome on the communal level, and at this point, a new life replaces the old life in its entirety. One can find contemporary approaches of a concentr concentrated pneumatology on the collective work of the spirit, such as in the work of Douglas Otati. However, can we really be satisfied without a description of the work of the spirit on the individual level, particularly regarding the occurrence of salvation? For Schleiermacher, it was possible to do so because his Christology explained the coming into being of faith itself along with it. According to Schleiermacher, we are taken into God consciousness through the impression Jesus makes on us as redeemer via his perfect God consciousness. An individual pneumatology is not needed on Schleiermacher's account, which is a reflection of the increase of Christocentrism that had already marked scholastic theology, yet was furthered during the Reformation, above all in the theological debates that followed. I would like to discuss one strand of this further Christocentric development in contemporary theology, which may serve as a footnote to the first volume of Bruce McCormick's uh, trilogy of dogmatic works on Christ, God, and the Atonement. My second point, um, the culmination of Christocentrism. This is not describing Bruce, but the debates, uh, one debate which is the footnote. The intent of the first volume, The Humility of the Eternal Son, as I understand it, is to open up the Christological presuppositions for a doctrine of God capable of explaining the implications of the incarnation for God's triune, triune being. 
Bruce McCormick goes against a new theological trend that centers on divine simplicity and God's capacity for suffering, according to which one could essentially have assumed that a relapse behind the achievements of the theology of re revelation in the 20th century could only mean a loss of any conception of God accessible under the conditions of modernity. Um, as one might infer from my previous uh, remarks in this regard, I share the critique of such a trend, simplicity trend, despite the discussion being a bit removed from my own context in Germany. We don't have that. McCormick is convinced that the Christological doctrines of Chalcedon are in need of repair. As far as I understand, the need for such a repair is twofold. First, a problem remained unresolved after Chalcedon and was not addressed by Barth nor any post barthians Second, the ancient Christological doctrinal decisions were supported via reverse ambitions to a metaphysical conception of God as absolutely simple and impossible. Such a conception is possible, yet it would not be Christian. In McCormick's proposal to repair Chalcedon, the re reappraisal of the history of Kenotic Christology plays a central role. The decisive question as to how one understands the subject of Kenosis is, what is the part, human part, which the Logos assumed in the incarnation and takes upon itself in humili uh, humiliation unto death? How then is the unity of the person of Jesus Christ to be understood? Moreover, did God actually take on human flesh in the Logos, or is it the human Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, as those in the post barthian tradition say, su such as Jüngel or J Jensen, that's your diagnosis as far as I see. <laughs> the two natures Christology from Chalcedon is effectively abandoned and difficulties arise regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. It is important how one rightly determines the second person of the Trinity in order to understand the subject of the history of Jesus. It is the history of the debates surrounding Kenosis, as McCormick reconstructs it, that, it would like it, uh, that I would like to add a footnote to. It concerns the periphery Christological debates in the late 16th and early 17th century. Reformed and Lutheran theolo theologians at that time famously disagreed on the question of whether Christ becomes present in the Lord, Lord's Supper, Lord Supper in the unity of his person, and thus also according to his human nature. This question was consequential in many other ways. It required one to, uh, to then ask, how is the unity of the person who, according to Chalcedon, is true God and true human, to be understood? How then does one understand omnipresence? Consequentially, what does kenosis mean and how are we to understand its implications? For the reformed, the humili humiliation only concerns the human nature of Jesus Christ. The presence of Christ at the Lord's Supper is the spiritual presence of the Logos, while the human nature, which can only be uh, singularly located, is seated at the right hand of God. The unity of the person is then only uh, is then given in the hypostatic union, in that the logos incorporates the human nature into his personal being. While this formulation seems quite simple and easily conceivable for the Lutherans, it did not work well. They would rather affirm that Jesus Christ is also bodily present in the Eucharist with Jesus' entire person. In order to say this, they developed a well-known thesis that Jesus Christ is able to be one person in two natures because the natures communicate to each other the so-called communicatio idiomatum. In sum, communication is the answer, yet communication is only real, according to the Lutheran understanding, when something is actually exchanged. And this is a very modern idea of communication. <clears throat> um, so what is it that the natures exchange? 
The, the answer is attributes. Not all attributes are exchanged, of course, only those Jesus possesses humanly, um, uh, possesses humanly according to the witness of scripture, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. On a, strict a strictly propositional level, the reforms could still adhere to such a formulation, but a real communication of attributes seemed to go beyond the integrity of the natures. At this point, neither side could make any progress. The footnote note I would like to add refers to the continuation of the Lutheran debate over the model after, uh, of Martin Chemnitz given the Lutherans did not find it satisfactory. So it's an eternal debate. In this context, it became increasingly clear that the theologians in Tübingen had different ideas than those in Gießen, as well as other northern locations in Germany. The discussion is no longer only about Eucharist, Rather, it is about the question of how one should actually understand the humiliation and the person who humbles himself. This question is the one uh, McCormick poses in his recent work. Initially, the Lutherans agreed that humiliation can be said to consist of the incarnate son of God renouncing the use of certain attributes during the earthly life, such as omnipotence and omnipresence, since otherwise it would not be possible for him to surrender himself unto death. This solution seemed adequate, yet the following question arose. Can one re renounce the use of attributes while still possessing them? <laughs> A university's dispute came about because of these questions in Tübingen and Gießen. And at the time, not quite so harmless, since one was not allowed to jeopardize the agreement in the confessional state so that one did not lose political protection. Since the theologians in Gießen, in the first place, simply wanted support from those in Tübingen for a debate in their own faculty, the disagreement developed rather accidentally. It was only when the Tübingen theologians were pressed several times to give an answer that it became clear that they had, been a diff uh, uh, they, they had a different thinking developed in Tübingen. They represented a rather bold thesis. There was no kenosis at all in Jesus' life, nor a renunciation of the use of attributes. In what way was it then self-humbling? Um, According to the Tübingen theologian, it was during the earthly existence of Jesus that the majesty of his person as the Son of God was hidden. Therefore, the model became known as Krypsis, thereafter making the Gießen-Tübingen uh, debate known in the history of theology as the Kenosis Krypsis dispute. Jesus could not renounce the use of omnipresence at all sins, Omnipresence is not an activity, so how to renounce it? Further, Jesus did not renounce omnipotence. Rather, he was omnipotent in that he did not use the power for himself. The controversy is interesting not because of the solutions, but because of the individual issues at stake and the theological concerns that em emerged from it. The first point to be mentioned is that the disagreement is about the understanding of presence. Whereas the theologians in Gießen understood present as an activity one can dispense at will, thereby develop, developing a fairly innovative understanding of presence, the Tübingen theologians maintained that there is also an inactive presence, a presence in which God is there even without doing anything. The question of how to think of God's presence continues to pre preoccupy us until today, especially when considering the problem of theodicy. But I also learned from Hannah Reichel that omnipresence is very important to understand digitization. <laughs> Um, second, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Um, a new understanding of omnipotence emerges from the Tübingen position. Omnipotence no longer means simply being able to control everything. It gains an entirely new meaning, 
whereby it consists in not using the power one possesses for one's own gain. Jesus renounced his power in his suffering and death, but precisely in his renunciation, he was powerful in and for the world. The third point in the debate relates to the understanding of personhood. Over the course of theological reflection on communicative personhood, one idea became particularly important for the Tübingen school. Namely, they held that the unity of the person in the communication of natures is only truly a unity when there is no asymmetry in the relations between the natures. There has to be a full symmetrical reciprocity. The true God human of the person of Jesus Christ consists in this full reciprocity of sharing and receiving. It is only when one-sidedness is removed completely and full uh, reciprocity is given that the person is united. It was clear that the human side does different things than the divine side, yet both are sharing and receiving in their own way all the time. Full reciprocity as a condition of unity was the central factor in Tübingen Christology. In their conception, the, they factually conceived the person of Jesus Christ as the place of unreserved union of God and humanity. And therein, they understood it as to be the archetype or exemplar of reconciliation, which was a strong and noteworthy thought. Consequently, the Tübingen theologian spoke of God's participation in suffering, but not of a suffering in God's divinity which distinguishes them from the modern God is dead theologies. The pe peculiarity of their theolo theology was the notion that the unity of the person can only be conceived through unrestricted mutual communication between God and the human, only if it is not conceived of as a third thing along the deity and humanity, which Chalcedon had rightly ruled out. It is this old controversy that I have found to be the origin of much of modern thought. The fact that Hegel was deeply influenced by these patterns of thought has been widely known. A few, a few years ago, it occurred to me that Schleiermacher also follows his line of thought as well, in a different manner, but with the same structures and insights. For Schleiermacher, there is no suffering in, of God, let alone a death of God. However, how he develops his understanding of the personhood of Jesus Christ is quite similar to that of the Tübingen perspective. He conceives it, of course, on the level of consciousness. Jesus Christ, in his perfect God consciousness, is determined by a full and living receptivity for God or the being of God in him. He allows himself to be completely permeated by God, whereby, it is, whereby he is the mediator. This is receptivity, not passivity. Jesus is active in his God consciousness in the continuous and always equally strong receptivity for God. Schleiermacher conceptually dismantled the formula of Chalcedon. Lutheran Christology and its consciousness theoretical reception in Schleiermacher has only one flaw. It negates the spirit. <laughs> the accusation of Christ Christocentrism is thus not unfounded, and a pneumatological Christolo Christology is therefore necessary. And that's something that you claim too. <laughs> My third point, no Christology without spirit. What role does the spirit play within Christology? To address this question, we will need, uh, first, first need to look at the accounts of the spirit in the gospel. Um, I've done this in my second lecture uh, in more detail, and I'm here uh, a little uh, shorter. Um, the gospels narrate the story of Jesus as a history started, accompanied, and completed by the spirit. Of, God, uh, of course, not all Jesus' deeds are specifically said to be done in the power of the Spirit, but in the Hebrew Bible, the working of the Spirit is also not emphasized at, in all deeds of God. That the Spirit of God is the uh, dynamis 
through which God works, however, can be assumed. The same can be said about the story of Jesus. The fact that Jesus does his prophetic activity, his proclamation, miracles, and signs, and wonders in the power of the Spirit need not to be emphasized for each individual work in light of the prophetic tradition. In John's Gospel especially, it seems the Spirit as Paraclete depends on Jesus and not vice versa. However, it is true only for the specific role of the Spirit as Comforter, whom Jesus sends to represent him after the Ascension, which does not exclude the possibility that Jesus' life is determined by the power of the Spirit. The most important claims regarding the Spirit's work in, with, and on Jesus are those made about the Spirit of God raising Jesus from the dead, whereby the disciples recognize the Spirit who in the appearance of the risen one, the Spirit who gives Jesus new life and completes his earthly life. The resurrection reveals that Jesus is and has always been the Son of the Father, this conclusion is drawn by the statements about pre-existence of the Son and his mediation in the act of creation. The one who is revealed in the story of Jesus as the Son of the Father was always the Son and was already involved in creation. It is true that the pre-existence statements, especially that of John 1, 5, 14, imply that the pre-existent son um, became human and thus was not human before. It cannot be inferred from this affirmation that the personhood of the son originally consisted in being logos azarkos, a logos without flesh. Bruce McCormack shows convincingly, in my opinion, that, quote, the Christological subject in Paul and the Christological subject in the four Gospels is the same, the God-human in his divine human unity. The Son, uh, recognized in the New Testament as belonging to God from eternity, is not a Logos Azarkos. But the Son, destined from eternity to manifest his sonship in his earthly life. At the same time, the notion of his pre-existence implies the pre-existent son as being with God and spirit. His pre-existent sonship is to be understood only in relation to the father and the spirit, which indicates the doctrine of the immanent trinity. I have already discussed the immanent trinity in the second lecture and argued that the spirit mediates the distinctness of father and son and thus their communion, so I need not detract us further here. But I come to the spirit and the mystery of redemption now. Despite there being little discussion of the spirit in much of the Protestant Christologi uh, Christological tradition, the spirit plays a significant role in the doctrine of salvation. First of all, the effect of the spirit in salvation fundamentally consists in that, in, in that the Spirit gives knowledge of meaning of the work of Jesus Christ. Already in the Hebrew Bible, knowledge and wisdom are bestowed by the Spirit. In the New Testament, especially in the, Deut the Deuteropauline works, the connection between the work of the Spirit and the knowledge of truth is emphasized. The author of Ephesians indicates the content of the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3 uh, verse 4, and emphasizes the mysteriousness in that the epistle does not begin with the author's own word, but uh, words, but um, the words of a hymn song about his, this mystery. It consists in the redemption of human, humanity by the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sin. The mysteriousness of the mystery has two dimensions. First, it is about the counsel of God before the foundation of the world, yet the foundations are beyond human experience. Second, the mystery that is now revealed includes Gentiles in God's plan of salvation. In comparing the Ephesian perspective with, with Paul's letters, it is not so much the mysterious character, but the scandalous nature of salvation that is emphasized by Paul, for it is accomplished through the foolishness 
of the cross. Redemption via the atonement of one uh, human on the cross for all and once for all was not only foolishness for the Jews, but for other reasons also for the Gentiles. The mystery of redemption remains, uh, remains as such, not least because the cross remains scandalous. The main questions are surely familiar to us. How is forgiveness of sin for all even possible through the death of one person? How, if at all, can the vicarious suffering and the penalty of sin exonerate the actual real per perpetrators of sin? Can the God who brings the, God, uh, the son to the cross really be a loving father? This is a question that I hear from my students all the time. Um, <clears throat> Why could God not simply forgive sin out of pure mercy without the death of Jesus Christ? These questions could occupy an entire lecture series themselves. Considering the knowledge of the spirit makes accessible according to the biblical understanding, however, it will become clear that these questions are partly hypothetical and partly sidestep knowledge of the redemption altogether. Knowledge of sin and grace. The knowledge the Spirit gives via preaching of the apostles according to the witness of scripture is a concrete or applied knowledge. The meaning of salvation becomes concrete in the knowledge of sin and grace. Knowledge of sin and grace of gra um, are uh, mutually dependent. In the New Testament epistles, the grace of God presupposes a knowledge of sin as transgressing the divine will. However, through the knowledge of grace, the understanding of sin is sim simultaneously changed. Considering Christ's death and resurrection, there is salvation for Jews and Gentile, making it apparent that all people are guilty as well as dependent on grace. Sin is thus universally applied to all humans. At the same time, in the demonstration of God's grace, it becomes evident that humans are not able to free themselves from the power sin holds. Sin is radical. So much for now about the principal correlation of the knowledge of sin and knowledge of grace. The correlation demands a dogmatic decision to serve as the starting point. Traditionally, sin was always addressed prior to grace which seemed to make sense both ontically and noetically. And this is also the um, uh, sequence in Law and Gospel. Ontically, sin is the reality of humanity from which grace redeems. Noetically, the knowledge of sin makes one receptive to grace. Schleiermacher, who embodies much of the Enlightenment, also discusses the consciousness of sin and, uh, before the consciousness of grace. At the same time, he makes it clear from the outset that Christians um, is always already aware of sin as forgiven. It was Karl Barth who outlined the dogmatic consequences of this by integ in integrating the doctrine of sin into the doctrine of reconciliation, all the while flowing from his Christology. What sin is can only be known from the vantage point of Christ. From my own perspective, such a, such a claim is true regarding the universal, uh, universality and radicality of sin. This is something that you can only um, uh, recognize in light of Christ. Yet historically, the knowledge of sin in the law of God forms the hermeneutical horizon for the knowledge of grace in the redemptive action of Jesus. The work of the Spirit, then, not only doesn't begin with the gift of knowledge of Christ's saving work, but it presupposes the work of the Spirit in the knowledge of God, to which the gift of the law belongs. Under this condition, the gift of knowledge, which the Spirit imparts in Christ, can then be inferred from the revealed grace. The knowledge of sin thus follows this inferential knowledge. Human redemption by the sin of God has three dimensions. First, redemption occurs in that God, in the power of the Spirit, enters into the conditions of life via the Son, even conditions determined by human sin. Jesus takes upon himself the consequences of his message, 
and submits himself to the entanglement of human judgments about him. The Gospels make it clear, especially in the different emphases of their reports, that Jews, Romans, and the citizens are involved in the condemn uh, condemnation of uh, Jesus. The Jews see him as blasphemer, the Romans see him as a political troublemaker, the citizens, for some inexplicable reason, have more sympathy for the latter in the decision between Jesus and Barabbas. This I take as a narrative illustration of the universal, universality of sin, which Paul infers from the universality of death and Lutheran theology from the death of Jesus for all humans. I would like to emphasize that the universal, uh, universality of sin is of great importance for working with diversity. In one respect, we are all equal and have reason to be humble and gracious in relation with one another. Second dimension, redemption occurs by grace, not because there would be a justified claim for salvation on the part of humanity. According to Pauline theology, God makes Jesus the propitiation for sin in his suffering on the cross. In death on the cross, Jesus fulfills the law and brings it to its end. The law is the good order of human life, but it is not a means of salvation. The grace God shows in the life and suffering of Jesus Christ is not, is not only shown without a debt to be paid, but in such a way that humans are not able to acquire it through performance, but can only accept it in faith. For salvation, as Paul explains it in Romans 3 and Galatians 2, it is not by works of the law, but by faith in the forgiveness accomplished in Christ. Corresponding to this dimension of grace is another insight about the nature of sin that became especially important in the Reformation. Human sin in relation to God culminates in one desiring to establish one's own righteousness and in so doing completely overestimates human abilities. A third insight, <clears throat> God's love is demonstrated in re redemption by entering gracefully into sinful reality. God, who gave the creature space alongside God as well as the creature's own life, redeems humanity from the separating power of sin by limiting it again in the in incarnation of the Son and taking on the form of a servant, Philippians 2. The love of God is manifested in selfless self-humbling, <clears throat> In this light, human sin is manifested in self-centered self-assertion. <clears throat> My sixth point, knowledge of faith as gift of the spirit. Thus far, we have seen redemption has its ground in the life, suffering, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is sustained by the work of the spirit. We have also seen that the further work of the spirit is to give people the knowledge of sin and grace which occurs through proclamation of the gospel wherein the grace of God is promised to people in a concrete way and in the context of their respective realities of life. And that's the um, uh, um, task of preaching to do this. This promise always needs new and diverse forms of language in preaching, liturgy, pastoral care, catechesis, etc. Reflecting, uh, reflecting on the forms of language falls within the realm of practical theology. The elementary premise to which exegetical and dogmatic theology draws attention is the composition of the Christian Bible from the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. While the Hebrew Bible opens up God's history with God's people as evidence of God's goodness and faithfulness as creator, the New Testament develops God's boundless love. The basis of the knowledge of sin and grace lies in a complementary interpretation of the Gospels and the Epistles. The Gospels talk about how God, in power of the Spirit, turns away humanity in Jesus. The Epistles narrate the overcoming of sin by God's grace 
uh, thus forming a new knowledge of God and of human self-knowledge. If one follows this characteristic style of the Gospels and Epistles in their narration, then the question mentioned earlier whether God could have accomplished God's will for reconciliation in a different way <clears throat> remains only hypothetical, in that it asks past the present of redemption, uh, the event of redemption. In Jesus Christ, of whom the evangelists report and whom the apostles proclaim, God has established the word of reconciliation for Jews and Gentiles, 2 Corinthians 5. Through such proclamation, the Spirit gives the knowledge of sin and grace with which a new life begins. Naming the Spirit as the gift of knowledge in the title of this lecture, it may, might be taken as simply being an echo of recent discourses on the notion of gift in theology. The theological reflections on gift are based on the reception of ethnological, sociological, cultural anthropological research of the social meaning of gift uh, in Marcel Mauss, Marcel Enough, uh, Alain Cahier, and the critical philosoph uh, philosophical reflection in Derrida and uh, Jean-Luc Marion. The theological reception is explained by the fact that gift is, as Oswald Bayer puts it, a primal word of theology. Bayer also noted at the same time that this word, however, still needs to be discovered and to be measured into ontology, as he says, which is fleshed out in the theological reception of theories of gift giving, on gift giving. Um, there is a debate in uh, Germany and uh, some parts in Europe. I'm not sure whether it is um, a deb debate here. <clears throat> in the meantime, many t attempts of discovery have been made um, which actually provide interesting information about the denominational profiles hiding in the background. Protestant receptions of gift are more interested in the one-sidedness of the relation of a gift in contrast to the exchange. Catholic receptions are more interested in the reciprocity of the gift and the return gift. Theologically, however, an economic understanding of gift is problematized throughout, especially by Catherine Tanner. For the economy of God's grace differs from human economy. As Tanner points out, it is unconditional, universal, and non-competitive, which also applies to the gift of knowledge of grace and sin worked out via the Spirit. On the one hand, the historical reconstruction of the emergence of the gift and its function in social behavior, even reaching back to the biblical writings themselves, is, help, is a helpful framework to keep in mind the specific profile of giving in the Christian tradition. On the other hand, however, I think it is difficult to make the category of gift the central theological concept and to narrow down the themes of justification, sacraments, and pneumatology to fit within this concept. When I speak of the gift of the spirit, I'm relying heavily on the linguistic formulation in the petition found in Ephesians 1.17. The God of Jesus gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him. Here, the mention of the spirit of wisdom echoes the promise of Isaiah 11.2. Upon him shall rest the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The gift of knowledge by the spirit means, for, first of all, that it is not a product of human cognitive effort. The human intellect is capable of knowing many things on its own, yet knowing that God shows grace to humanity by overcoming the separating powers of sin is the mysterious revelation that the intellect cannot conceive. Even further, it is contrary to human conceptions of God's deity. The knowledge of God mediated by the Spirit is not a general knowledge of the nature of God, but the concrete knowledge of how God reveals God's self to humanity in God's action. 
This action is summarized in the three articles of the Apostles' Creed, of which Luther writes so impressively in the large catechism, namely that here God has opened the deepest abyss of God's fatherly heart. Luther rejected speculation about the nature of God beyond revelation in his actions as a theologia gloriae. Salvation from sin through Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit is the gift of grace, the knowledge of which the Spirit imparts and in which the Spirit gives wisdom. The formal expression gift of knowledge might be understood as though gift were something static. A static understanding of gift, however, is not the biblical conception. The work of the spirit is dynamic and the knowledge wrought by the uh, spirit is also a thoroughly dynamic event. Grace is not, is not once recognized and held as a knowledge only then to be put away, but it determines human life. It is true that the promise of grace frees us from the concern for a successful and fulfilled life, thus liberating us from centering our lives on ourselves and opening up, uh, us up for fellow humanity. To put it this way precisely describes a, dy a dynamic event understood differently in confessional ways, as I would like to explain briefly with reference to the Protestant Catholic dialogue. An essential component in the Reformation controversy over justification and grace was the question of how to understand the renewing power of grace and effect of baptism. Is sin taken away in baptism or is it forgiven? The agreement on the doctrine of justification reached in the Joint Declaration on Justification 1999 did not elimin eliminate this discord. According to the Roman Catholic understanding, original sin is erased in baptism. According to the Reformation understanding, sin is forgiven in baptism, but not erased. Accordingly, Catholics and Protestants also describe the knowledge of faith and the reality of life of the Baptist per by baptized person differently. According to the Catholic understanding, after baptism, there remains a scale form formis of sin, an inclination to sin, which however is not to be called sin. So this is something the Catholic uh, baptized person knows. The scale explains why new sin can occur again, the separating power of which is then removed by repentance. According to Reformation theology, the baptized person is both a righteous person and a sim sinner, simul justus et peccator. One is righteous because God forgives personal sin in faith, one is a sinner because the symbolic act of baptism does not sublate the human structure of consciousness characterized by self-centeredness. The difference in the understanding of the human situation after baptism has still not been clarified um, between Catholic and Protestants. Following the joint declaration on the do doctrine of justification, the ecumenical working group of Protestant and Catholic theologians in Germany has dealt at length with the question of whether a common understanding of humans as both righteous and sinner is possible. But they could not agree on a common appropriation or rejection of the formula. For Catholics, it is not possible to call the baptized person a sinner because this would de deny the renewing power of baptism. Conversely, the Protestants claim that the inclination to sin, which according to the Catholic understanding remains after baptism, is precisely sin. This inclination to rebel against God's commandment has its reason in human self-centeredness. The reorientation in faith is a process that is dogmatically described as growing into baptism. Ideally, in this process, the attitude of Christian gains more and more dominance over the inward curvature of oneself. I know that this is a Luther interpretation question. <laughs> um, this process is nourished by the deepening knowledge of grace. For knowledge of grace implies fulfillment and the meaning of life lie in communion with God and fellow human beings and that forgiveness is the gift of a new beginning. In the awareness of grace, 
Freedom arises in order to distance, distance oneself from the aims of a self-centered life and patterns of behavior, thereby opening oneself to, um, up to fo fellow human beings. Faith's knowledge of grace and sin is a gift of the spirit given to us, yet not, such in, yet not in such a way that the human disposed of it uh, owns uh, one's own accord, but in such a way that it becomes human knowledge determining one's perception and action. A final point, Christian feelings as gifts of the spirit. In Ephesians, the author not only asks God to give the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him, the author also asks the spirit, give the Ephesians enlightened eyes of the heart so that they may know the hope to which they are called and the riches of the inheritance. Already in the Hebrew Bible, knowing is not a process limited to the act activity of the intellect, but concerns the human heart and mind. In the same way, knowing is also understood in a holistic sense in the New Testament. The knowledge the spirit affects involves the intellect, determines the affective aspects of human life, and thus reaches the human will. One expression of the affective effective effect <laughs> is that the way Christian emotions are described in the New Testament. I'm drawing on the work of Robert C. Roberts, whom I had met at CTI. He exhibits that the New Testament features in varying degrees of prominence a number of uh, attitudinal phenomena that in modern, modern parlance would be called emotions and the practices in which emotions are expressed, joy and rejoicing, gratitude and thanksgiving, remorse or regret and repentance, compassion, anger, fear, sorrow, envy, pride, shame, contempt, and others. The evangelists also report some of that, these emotion about Jesus. Jesus could rejoice, be grateful, have compassion, but he had also experienced anger and wrath. In Paul, joy appears as the particularly important religion emotion, religious emotion. Paul explicitly counts it among the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5.22. In John, on the other hand, love and harmony dominate. The theological reflection on human emotions has passed through many stages, marking a flux in the cluster of problems. Significant for our purposes here is the alteration in the linguistic use, usage. Prior to the Enlightenment, theology used the terms passions and affections, passiones and affectiones. It emphasized a differentiation between bodily sensations that humans share with animals and emotions that take place at the level of human consciousness and will. Such a distinction cannot be sustained. It is then helpful that through the course of the Enlightenment, new terms are found, such as the German term Gefühl and the English term emotion. Groundbreaking for the, under for the understanding of religion's emotion is, of course, William James, who deals critically with the German debate and argues against an essentialism in the conception of religious emotions. He mainly asserts that religious sentiments are not sentiments sui generis, but are sentiments directed to a religious object. Following James, Robert uh, traces the distinctiveness of religious emotions to the content taught in a religion. Quote, the Christian emotions are given their distinctive character by their doctrinal content. This is the sense in which the Christian emotions are propositional, end quote. Nevertheless, they cannot be reduced to propositionality, but escape reduction to their propositional content because emotions are a sort of, as he says, concern-based impression or perception or construal of the situation in these terms. For example, the emotions that arise when I look at a landscape are able to be put into language 
But with such language, I cannot represent the feeling to others as I, it feels to me. If one understands religious emotion as concern-based situational construals, then it already implies that religious emotion is not simply a gut reaction, but rather, li uh, ra rather work like a, a feedback loop. Um, this seems to be a big discussion in the uh, this, um, emotion um, uh, research, um, what gut reaction, what the um, role of gut reaction is. And here they say it is only a feedback loop, but it's not in the first place a gut reaction. In pneumatological terms, I would like to describe religious emotions such as joy, love, compassion, gratitude, fear, shame, remorse, or anger as resonances of the knowledge of the spirit. In so doing, I choose a term prominently used by the German sociologist Hartmut Rosa in his Sociology of World Relations, and this is only titled Resonances. He chooses this concept of resonance, among other things, with recourse to the concept of neurological resonance. Drawing on, his, on this terminology, religious emotions can be understood as resonances that the spirit effects in the affective life of believers. One could also say that they are the deep dimension of the gift of knowledge. They are made possible by the Christian contents of faith, but they are the deep and very personal resonance in the individual, which colors Christian perception and feeling of life, shapes behavior, and motivates actions. Thank you. Thank you.